Hello everybody, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and thanks to a viewer for pointing this out, but a couple of days back, Stencil 4.0 was released. Now, if you've never heard of it, Stencil is one of those codeless game creation kits. It kind of falls into the same category as GDevelop or Construct in scope and capability. Uh, behind the scenes, it's hacks programming language based, and it allows you to basically create games by scripting the logic using bricks of logic layers. But you can jump down below that and have like a finer tuned control of your code. So we're gonna jump in and take a look at what Stencil 4 is all about, what the update is, but I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of depth because I've actually done a hands-on uh, tutorial guide to this guy, which I will also link down below. So without further ado, let's jump in and take a look at the news. Now, first off, we have Stencil itself. It's available at stencil.com. Now you can grab this guy uh, for free and the pricing structure basically works this way. The free version for starter uh, enables you to publish to the web or to their own arcade. The indie version is $100 a year. This enables you to publish to desktop targets as well. And then studio, you can publish to iOS, Android, web, and desktops. And that's at $200 a year. Now keep in mind the... Um, starter version does allow you to build for those platforms you just can't publish for them so without further ado let's take a look at what is new in stencil 4. and the marquee features we see here are compatibility with ios 12 and osx mojave uh, performance improvements for mobile desktop and in-app for large projects live testing so you can load a specific scene or reload a scene while testing a game really speeds up your debugging cycle uh, copy and paste is now supported in the scene designer html5 support this is probably the biggest one previously Again, the Hacks ecosystem itself and Stencil really kind of relied on, ha on uh, the Flash Player behind the scenes. And we all know the writing is pretty much on the wall for Flash Player. So what they've done is they've added native HTML5 support. Does that make any sense? Native HTML... Anyways, they added HTML5 support to Stencil. So you can now build for HTML5 instead of the Flash Player. You can still build for the Flash Player, by the way. And then they've got 200 plus bug fixes. So you see the various different things here. If you want to go through the full logs, uh, there were a number of things that were fixed behind the scenes. But that is the uh, TLDR version of what is new in Stencil 4. So obviously the performance improvements, OSX and Mojave support and HTML5 support are probably the biggies on that list. Now, I did it a hands-on with the earlier version, part of the Closer Look series. I will link this down below, but it basically walks you through the process of creating your game, of coding your game, of what the tools are all involved in. So I'm just going to do a very quick glance of Stencil 4.0. Uh, if you want more details, do check out for this link down below. At the end of it, there is also a video of the hands-on with the Stencil programming. So if you want to learn more about Stencil, be sure to check this out. But today we're going to look at a quick and dirty rundown of Stencil. Now this is me downloading it already. It is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, you see here, you create your first game. We click right here to create it. We'll create a game, a blank game. Now, the cool thing is there are a ton of different assets and resources available. You can see here we click over and we can download various different examples to get us started. But we're going to show you from scratch. So we're going to create a new game, blank game. Next, we'll call it my game. You set the default resolution and go ahead and create. So we just created our first game. And you'll see over here we have our various different resources that go into using this game. So, for example, we wanted to create a tile map out of tiles we can do so using tile sets. Now, one of the really cool things with Stencil is the access to uh, Stencil Forge and Stencilpedia. Stencilpedia is kind of like a Wikipedia for Stencil. Stencil Forge is an asset um, archive that's built directly into it. So you see over here, we can grab, uh, let's say tile sets. So we could have full kits, extensions to it, and so on. But I'm gonna come in here, grab this one tile set right here. Come on, download. It's gonna bring it down. All right, so we now have that tile set available for a game. As you can see right here, we're in the tile set editor. You can set collision masks for your tiles and so on. And now that we've got that, let's go on back over here and we're gonna go ahead and create a scene. So we have no scene yet, create a new scene and call it my game. And you can structure it in width and, uh, width and height of tiles or you can use pixels. We'll stick with tiles because we have a tile map. Set your tile dimensions and you can also set your background color. We'll go ahead and create that scene. And here you are in the editor. So over here, we can grab a bunch of tiles. So grab that guy right there. And then we could just grab that middle guy and paint across for a while. And you see you've got a full tiled map editor built in like so. Uh, and you can do, obviously, as you see here, multi-selection like this. So you can create your maps quick and easy using this. You've also got layer support down here. So you can have a background layer to mix or interact with your tiles. But it's pretty straightforward and clean to get started with. So there we've created our basic level. Uh, see the asterisk up here because I haven't saved it. I'll save that guy up. And then we can go over here. We can apply behaviors. This is behaviors at the level level. 
that sounded weird, but it's actually correct English. Uh, so this, you can attach behaviors to control how your level behaves. But instead, what we're going to do is go back to the scene over here and we're going to attach an actor to it. So go back to our dashboard, actor types, and we're going to go ahead and create a new actor. Actors are basically entities within your world. So we'll call this one player and we will create it. And now you'll see tabbed work for it, work, um, workspace right here. So we got a player we can bring in right now. I'm going to go back to Stencil Forge over here and bring in, uh, we can bring in an actor, but I just need to bring in some graphics. So let's bring in, uh, well, I don't know if I can bring in just a graphic. Huh. Because I don't want a full blown actor. I don't want any logic printed on it. Hmm. I'm not entirely certain what the difference is there. So anyways, what I'm going to do instead is I'll bring in something from my own computer. So we go back here over to, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Go back over here to player, click here to create our player. Uh, we need an animation to create. So we'll go ahead and add, we'll choose, and I will go to this PC documents. Where the heck is Dropbox on here? Uh, D, sorry. Switching up my computers make things a little confusing. So this is a bit of a, uh, a spoiler for an upcoming uh, project I have going on. So projects, Godot, assets, uh, 720p sized, and we will go ahead and bring in one of these sprites. Here we go. So we now have a sprite for our world. Unfortunately, you can't zoom here, uh, which is kind of irritating. Um, so I can't zoom in and look at the sprite in full detail. And the other thing is it brought it in as not even close to the size that it was. So um, I can't set the size here. And it doesn't really matter. We'll go ahead. We'll create that guy. So we now have a sprite frame for our player. And we could, we could add it to the scene this way, or we can just save it and head on back over to our scene. So here we are in a game. So go over to actors, and you'll see here we could add our player. And we can instance a player into uh, our scene. So it's selected. And there we now have a player in our scene. Um, and it's not going to do anything. So you can test your game over here. So you got your options, Flash Player, HTML5, Android, Windows, CPPIA. Uh, so this is your hacks build in the background. So we're just going to go ahead and create an HTML5 one. Go ahead and test that game out. And then we're going to find out what my default browser is, because I have a feeling it might still be Edge. Nope. Okay, we're good. All right, so there we just added in. We got a bit of a warning here about... Uh, Windows Defender blocking it, but then nothing we can do about it. Um, all right, so there we go. So there is our game running in the browser. Pretty simple and straightforward. Now let's go back and add a little bit of logic to our, our character here. So you can select a character that way. But what I want to do, go back to the player, and you'll notice here across the top, so we've got appearance. We set up our single frame. So if we had multiple frames of animation. Uh, we could define the different frames here, the different animation names, and so on. So this one is just animation zero. So you always have, even with a single sprite, you have a single frame animation to go with it. But what we're interested in is either behaviors or events. Now, these things are kind of very, very similar, but you can think of uh, behaviors as predefined and preconfigured events, kind of reusable building blocks. And there are a ton of them available off the hop, or you can create events yourself. And this is where your programming logic comes in. I'll show you the quickie method, and then we'll just go back and use a behavior because it's already been developed and vetted and so on. We come up here and you got your various different events that you can wire up the, to handle. So I see here uh, when creating or when drawing or screen or when updating. So those are your main loops. So on creation and then each pass through the game loop for drawing or updating, uh, you can hook up to any one of those events and then your event will fire when those events fire. So we can do a really simple one. So when updating like this, and then we can come in here to actor and we could say motion uh, and we'll say push actor gently towards location. So push self gently toward um Go with 400 and 400 at 10 force. I got no idea what those units of measure are, but it gives you an idea of how a building block works. And then we could go ahead, save that. We can test our game out. And this will be called each pass through the game loop. And our guy should move uh, towards 400 by 400 at a steady pace. And there you see it in action. And then it's interacting with the um, predefined, preconfigured collision masks on the tile set in the background. And that is the gist of how you would go ahead and create logic for your game. And you just kind of keep building things together uh, as they make sense in your loop. And you've got your things like you've got flow control. So you have uh, ifs and fors and stops and your traditional loops. Uh, you have triggering and events. You can send events or we can do things like drawing. And we can draw text on screen during 
So we wanted to add another event, basic when drawing. And then we could say, draw the text at, so hello world. And then give it a coordinate at one and one. And then each frame that will be drawn, we'll go ahead and run that. And you will see we have our one event on each frame moving our sprite and our other one drawing the hello world. And we have an error. Player, player, what is your issue? I wonder if I needed to quote that. Save, make sure I didn't, oh yeah, uh, no, that's my bad. No, I just wanna grab this guy. So we can pull out an individual tile. Sorry, I forgot I threw that guy in there. So go ahead and run that. And now you will see, bump, bump, bump. Well, the cool thing is, or the interesting thing is, this is attached to the player. So when we draw our text, it's gonna be immediately obvious that that's the case. You're seeing the hello world text is being drawn there. So if we wanted to draw that at a single time, we could instead of attach the event to our scene, uh, as we saw earlier on, let's close that down. Uh, we've got our scene. So we go back over to our scene here. We've also got behaviors and events at the scene level. We also can control our physics defaults. Uh, sprite atlases and uh, various different scene properties such as the width and height and such when we first created our scene. So very simple to, to create and author entities. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete both these guys. So we'll just hit the minus key here and I'll get rid of that guy and I'll get rid of that guy. So if a lot of times if you're coming in here from a non-programming perspective, what you're going to probably do is just use predefined behaviors. And again, there are a ton of behaviors available in the uh, Stencil Forge. So if you don't see something you need, you can probably get something there. But you'll see here, we've got a bunch here. So let's say controls. If I wanted to give it uh, vertical control, I could just go ahead and click that guy in. And then you'll see the various different parameters or settings that we can do. So I'm going to say here and go, uh, for up, I want up. For down, I want down. And I can set the speed to move by. Uh, I'll turn animations off and save that so our player now has vertical controls according to the up and down arrow we'll go back over here and we are going to see the end result in a second all right here we go so now i should be able to use my keys there you see so that is how you would easily add um you know controls to your character and that's how uh behaviors work Be behaviors are just kind of defined events. You can actually build uh, event and save it or export it as a behavior. So these are kind of like pre-made building blocks. And as you saw, I'll go back to the ad, you'll see we have a bunch of different options. So we got a number of them for controls, move towards the mouse, face the mouse, fire a bullet. Uh, we got things like we can explode or fade over time, flicker on collision, a lot of things you would commonly see in 2D style games. We've got uh, stuff in here for switching your scenes out, following the camera. We've got UI controls for buttons. We've got motion controls. Uh, a bunch of rules about how to die or die in a collision and so on. So you have a bunch of predefined behaviors. And once again, if we go back to the stencil forge over here, after I close that modal dialogue, you'll see if we go to behaviors, there are a number of them in here. Is there a page count? No, I have no idea how many there are. Uh, but you can come in here and say most downloaded, newest, highest rated, so on. And there's a ton in here, or you can search. So if you're looking for cameras, for example, I can come up here and say camera. And there you see a whole ton of the camera options. You can also publish your own things up here easily enough. It is one of the options up here So for um, sharing out your tools. There's a tool in here for basically building or bundling things into uh, your own shareable tools. So. Pretty straightforward. And then as I mentioned earlier on, the free version, you're really limited on publishing. Now, in development, I could come in here, I'm not gonna do it because it's slow as hell, but I could do a Windows build or a CPPIA build and let that run. Uh, but what I can't do is publish to anything other than the web. So you see those are pro only features. So if you need desktop and mobile publishing, you're gonna need to either go to that $99 tier or $199 tier. And that's where they make their money on their system. And you know what, it's a fairly, um, I think it's a good compromise. The other thing to keep in mind is I have seen stencil on sale or bundled into like humble bundles, etc., a handful of times for a literal fraction of the cost. So do keep an eye out for that as well. Um, so yeah, that is kind of the extent of it. You see here, we got our events programming. Now, the one thing that's really cool that I haven't really touched on, um, if I go here into an event, like here, or let's say, okay, I'm going to go to player. I'm going to define an event. I'm going to add that event to it. So basic, when created, we're going to, uh, I have no idea what we're going to do. Actor, we're gonna enable gravity. There we go. So when this character is created, let's go ahead and enable gravity. 
So now if we head up here to this menu, I believe it is View, and we go to Code Preview or press Control J, we're actually seeing the code that's being generated behind the scenes. So this is ultimately a hacks code generator, and hacks itself can be targeted towards multiple different platforms and languages and so on. So you see here, very straightforward, we've created an actor that extends actor script, and then on the init function, or in this case, the created, uh, we just go ahead and set actor dot set ignore gravity. So this is ultimately a code generator. And if you want, you can actually have your event simply call hacks code that you provide yourself. You can additionally create your own events as you go through things. Now, the cool thing here is also if I switch back over here to behaviors, we'll see here, here's our two way vertical behavior that we've got predefined out of the box. And again, as I showed you earlier, there are a ton of different options here. But what you see over here is I can come up here to edit behavior and then we're going to see uh, don't show me this. This is the set of behaviors or set of events that go into that behavior. So you see here, we've got an event for on created on updated custom event and another custom event. So you see here, mouse down, mouse up events being handled. And here is your update event. Now, what's really kind of cool here is I can click here and go to preview code. Now, I don't know why this isn't an event, but I can preview code and we can actually see the hacks code that is being generated by these behaviors, even behaviors that came kind of turnkey out of the box. So that is your programming experience. And you've got, again, nice nested so you can switch between what you're doing. Now, the last thing I'm gonna really show you is the remainder of what you can do for your player. So you come in here, that was events and programming. So your behaviors and events. We've also got collision. So we saw it created a default collision mask for our object. We could define a finer tune one for uh, polygons. We could do this across all the various different animations. Uh, we can set physics properties for this guy from general settings to heaviness, material, dampening. And we get into uh, advanced settings there as well. Plus, you can set general properties for this character. Uh, and I believe you can pull these elsewhere. So some really cool tools built in here. Uh, good, nice integration into a community of events that you can build directly from inside. So again, if I need a sign, I can go ahead. I can create one this way. Or I can head on over to the Stencil Forge, go into Sounds and find what I'm looking for. So if I'm looking for a gunshot, come in here, search for gun, and add that to my scene. So if I need a sound file, again, I just go on back here to my sound. Uh, oh, no, I'll go back, dashboard, sounds, we'll create one, uh, I'll call it gun, and I should have access to it. So where the heck did it go? Where did it go? Sound effect type, edit in, hmm. Anyways, I can hook up my resource, or was my resource automatically added? Doesn't really matter. Ultimately, not that important. It might actually already be. No, that's for importing. Again, yeah, does not matter uh, how do you hook that up. Just know that there are a huge number of resources that you can pull in directly from this guy, and especially useful if you are just beginning and starting out, because then you have all of these art resources at your fingertips, uh, and that always makes it easier to get up started and learning things. Again, we've also got uh, some extensions going on, uh, some game kits to get you up and started and you can upload and share your own resources as well. So definitely a, a very cool thing for getting people up and going and a pretty straightforward experience overall, at least I think so. I also think again, that business model is pretty fair. Um, so we've got, um, where did you go? Here we go. Uh, the Indie at $99 enables those additional publishing platform and studio enables the mobile ones on top. So. I wish these they had like a straight up buy it option, but moving to subscription only model just seems to be a thing people are doing. So if you were looking for something in this space, Stencil is by no means alone. Like I said, there's GDevelop, uh, which is actually completely free. There's Stencil, uh, there's Construct2, which has nowhere near as good of a free version available, um, but has a very similar pricing model and a very similar programming model. So that is Stencil, and that is Stencil 4.0, at least a quick look at it. Let me know what you thought of it down below. And again, all of the links for everything I covered will be down there as well. Have you worked with Stencil or in GDevelop or Constructor? Have you by chance worked with all of them? If so, which one did you like using the best? All right, I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.